So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to address the accusation that the characters of Cyborg and Flash and Aquaman, they didn't get sufficient backstory for Justice League. I find that rather a naive statement, a very simple statement, given that all stories have context to them. That's why I always say you need to first tell me the story of Justice League before you can make such statements and then show how the characters were insufficient for the story being told. Now, for many of you who do not know what the story of Justice League was, I will tell you in about a sentence or two. The story is about Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman, having a sense of hope after Superman's death, spurring him on to recruit people with special abilities to defend against an oncoming threat to the world that he believes could destroy it. That is Justice League in a nutshell. Therefore, whatever background of the characters we get must serve that story. When Justice League begins, we begin with Superman. And that makes sense, because Superman is the focus of this trilogy, and he's also the reason that Bruce Wayne is going around trying to recruit other people with special abilities. Because Superman was such a person with special abilities. He may not have been human, but he was a person with special abilities. And for those of you who know about BVS, you would know that Batman, on seeing someone with such special abilities, thought that Superman was a threat. He has now changed his mind going 180 degrees since Wonder Woman, and he now believes that these people with special abilities are actually not to be gotten rid of or destroyed, but to be recruited. So... Justice League begins with Superman. The reason Batman is recruiting people is because he has the hope of Superman now. And that's a whole other long story that we can go into concerning BVS. It is an almost immediate continuation of BVS. BVS ended with Superman. And so in good standing and in really good continuity, it begins, Justice League that is, with Superman. And the story continues. We see Superman explain what hope is, how it can be lost, and how it can be regained. Very fitting for the story that's going to be told and the story that has partially been told up to BVS. We then go into a segment where Batman is now introduced. First we were introduced to Superman, now we are introduced to Batman. And in the introduction of Batman, he uses a robber to track down a parademon and catch it. In so doing, we reach one of the focal points that ended BVS, which is the mother boxes. We are introduced to them now in Justice League. But they do not take for granted that you know about these mother boxes, even though you've seen them in the extra footage of Wonder Woman, and you've also seen them at the end of Justice League with Lex Luthor in the Kryptonian ship. And so it's explained to you that these three boxes have significance, and they were seen in Lex Luthor's notes. On seeing this, and having the assistance in storytelling through the robber, who is telling us bits and details that we need to know, and we are visually seeing some bits and details through the newspaper article that tells us that Superman is dead, we are able to garner both visually as well as verbally that Superman has died and there is an impending invasion by aliens because he has died. And the robber even suggests what do human beings do now, which is a continuation to what BVS was about, where Batman is recruiting these people with special abilities to defend the world. 
So it explains everything from BVS and the end of BVS that Batman was basically discussing with Wonder Woman. But they just do it in this movie so that it's self-contained. I thought brilliant work by Joss Whedon. In so doing, Batman goes to the next step. And he tells Alfred, it's uh, prep the jet, we're going north tonight. That means he's going to an Icelandic village to find Aquaman, clearly. And so Alfred pulls up the different Justice League characters, as you can see them here. These are all straight out, straight out of the archives from BVS. These are literally snapshots from BVS, except for Ray Fisher's picture. And again, showing the continuity between BVS and Justice League. So the thing that makes Zack Snyder so brilliant is not only can he do a self-contained movie in which he's giving you all the information and might have to repeat information, but he's also showing you a direct continuity from the previous movie. At the end of Man of Steel, we had a Metropolis disaster. And Zack Snyder painstakingly recounts that scene from a human perspective, from Batman's perspective, giving you direct continuity. And here, Joss Whedon and Zack Snyder, because Joss Whedon didn't exclusively do this uh, segment with Batman, Joss Whedon and Zack Snyder bring to your recollection what has happened at the end of BVS, how Wonder Woman was able to see and Bruce Wayne was able to access the information files on these people with special abilities, and when we see how they play into Batman needing to recruit them. You also get the reason for Batman doing this is because Superman has died and therefore this threat has come up because of his death. As well as we also find out that Batman holds true to his ideals, the hope that Superman has put within him. Where we begin Justice League with Superman discussing hope. And this is the hope that Batman holds on to so that the world will be saved from impending disaster. So it ties in really brilliantly with BVS and the end of BVS, but at the same time, it also establishes the reason Batman is doing what he's doing. Which, if you go and look at the story summary for, BVS, uh, for Justice League, if you just go up on IMDB or any other site, and you look at the, st summary, the story summary of Justice League, it's exactly that. Imbued with the hope from Superman, Batman goes on to recruit the other members of the Justice League to deal with a, a world th threat. Okay, so everything the story is bringing to the table has to do with that. If it doesn't have to do with that, then we don't want to know about it. Okay, and Joss Whedon tried to streamline the story to make sure the editors and everything try to keep it focused on the story it was telling. So let's keep it moving. So the main protagonist in this movie will be Batman. He is the one recruiting the lead. He's the leader. Wonder Woman will assist him. She's also a leader, and she, in her own way, will be able to bring these members of the team together. Okay? Now, that means that the major characters that we need to continue this movie with are Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman, and as we will find out later on, Louis Lane and Martha Kent. Because those are spillovers from the continuity of BVS. We always had Martha Kent in the story. We always had Lewis Lane in the story. And so these characters actually presented right after Batman speaks with Alfred. So right after this scene, we lead, later see Lewis Lane and we see Martha Kent. But this story is propelled forward because of Batman. Because he holds the ideals Superman has within him, the hope within him that helps him to recruit this team. And we see, therefore, Batman and Superman, the major characters, will be going through this movie. And then we see Wonder Woman. When we see Wonder Woman appear on the scene, we see her in action. We saw Batman in action. We saw Superman in action. We also see Wonder Woman in action. But from the context of a protector, once again... And this is a continuity not only of BVS where she was a protector, but also it's a continuity from Wonder Woman where she acted as a protector. In fact, the last scene in Wonder Woman is Wonder Woman jumping off the balcony of the Louvre, jumping across the river, it looks, into what looks like England where there is some sort of smoke coming up from a building. Okay? The last thing we see her going off to do is to save lives and protect. Okay? 
and you hear her pledge towards mankind and to do everything in her power to see a better world. So it's not surprising that not only is Justice League a continuity of BVS, but it's also a continuity of Wonder Woman. And that's what makes this film so incredible. It is not just a continuity of one film. It is a continuity of two films. <laughs> and it even meshes together sometimes certain scenes you've taken for granted in Man of Steel. It's actually a continuity in a separate way from BVS of Man of Steel, which is even more crazy. So I'm going to try and break this down. I have not gone into de I will not go into detail about these different characters, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. I'm just showing you that they serve to fuel the storyline. And more importantly, you have to understand that the characters, the additional characters of Aquaman, Cyborg, and The Flash serve to carry this storyline forward, which is these people with special abilities that Batman recruits and has to learn to work together with to be able to defend the Earth against a threat. This is the storyline. This is the story, so you have to go with that story. We cannot have irrelevant material of the background of these characters that does not apply to an interaction and an interfacing with the key principal characters of Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. Okay? It must always, their backgrounds must always be with respect to the story being told. And that's why I said the story is always important when you are telling, when you are watching a film. Is the background of these characters relevant to the story being told? That's why I ask the people. All the people with the critics, all, you know, Cyborg didn't have enough, and, and Flash didn't have enough, and there was deleted scenes, and you know what? I'm like, yeah, but was it relevant to the story? Was it going to be a distraction, or was it going to be relevant to the story? Telling me about all these deleted scenes and this deleted scene. Who cares? Is it going to serve the story or not? If it's just extra fun, or it's fun to know about, but it is not focused. Now, you must understand, Justice League is built around three essential characters, which are the founding members of the Justice League. Three essential characters. Superman. Batman. And Wonder Woman. The Trinity is the foundation of the Justice League. And even though the Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg are foundation members, they are secondary. Let me say it again. They are secondary to the Justice League. This is why we had Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. You know why it was the Dawn of Justice? Not because of Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg. No, because we had the founding Trinity. And once you have the Trinity, you have the Dawn of the Justice League. Now, there is another reason why it's called the dawn of the Justice League, because in Batman's heart, after Superman died, he had the hope Superman put in his chest and a new birth of humanity, where he became Bruce Wayne. So there's this additional bit of information that you can extrapolate from this. This is not an assumption, folks. This is just facts, okay? Zack Snyder made a logo, Batman v Superman, where you see the logo of Superman inside of the Batman symbol. Okay? So it's not, it's, <laughs> we're not in, we're not assuming anything here. Zack Snyder literally spells it out. Hope inside of the Bat symbol. Batman has now hope inside of him concerning the future of the world, concerning people with special abilities who are not like him. Before he did not have hope, he had fear of them. Now he's hopeful for them because he has been transformed by Superman into a hopeful Batman. We've never seen this kind of Batman before. We've never seen a Batman who's hopeful. Okay? Never. We've never ever seen that. So, I want you to understand what Zack Snyder was going for and also... This is not this is not guessing. I'm not guessing here, okay folks? All right. So, continuing on. So, I guess I was saying Batman is a hopeful Batman, and because he's driven by that hope, he's recruiting this league which he knows there's a threat. Now he knows it from Lex Luthor if you were following BVS, but since this is a self-contained movie, they literally spell out. Okay? That Batman is recruiting this league because he knows there's a threat coming. And he will say it to Wonder Woman later on. 
And Wonder Woman will confirm it yet a second time. Lex Luthor confirmed it. Batman re- used Lex Luthor's notes. Batman tracked down the parademons to see there really were aliens coming. And now he knows it's something to do with the boxes. And then Wonder Woman comes and confirms it, right? But let's get back to the story, right? So we now have established the three major characters. One is dead, which is Superman. But we see him established in Justice League. We had an interview with him while he was alive. We see Batman. He's on his crusade. He's hunting down these parademons. He's looking at Lex Luthor's notes. He's researching information. Okay? That's a continuity from when he last saw Lex Luthor in BBS. He's getting confirmation. He realizes he needs to recruit the team immediately. Okay? Okay. Wonder Woman, who is the other member, she is the continuity of the end of Wonder Woman as well. She's the continuity of Wonder Woman we saw in BBS. It's a continuity of both, where she's again acting as a protector to facilitate the best in mankind. And she's protecting a some people in a court that was about to be exploded. And the court, everything about the court represents what she is, okay? If you watch it, almost every shot in that court scene where the terrorist is moving through that building, you will see that Lady Justice is looking at him at every single point. It, go and look at the shots. On the walls, you would see a picture of Lady Justice, or you would see a sculpting of Lady Justice looking at the, the, the terrorist. Every place he moves inside of there. In fact, there's even a brochure on the side with Lady Justice looking at him. It's just crazy. Okay? And now, another very interesting thing is Lady Justice, which is, okay, she's Roman, but the Greek analog of that is, um, 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 but the dress and the, the wear of Lady Justice is very much the dress and wear, though the relaxed version, uh, Wonder Woman's always in military fatigues, but the relaxed version of Wonder Woman's era of clothing wear. Literally, Wonder Woman is literally the embodiment of Lady Justice. So it's just really crazy that at every turn in that building, it's like Lady Justice, the, the personification of Lady Justice in Wonder Woman has come to life and was just judging the, these guys straight through. I mean, it was just crazy. So biblical and just crazy and just everything about it is just crazy. But we got introduced to Wonder Woman. These are the foundation blocks of the Justice League. Now, we are introduced to the other members of the Justice League here, but then we see that Batman is now only through Batman and Wonder Woman we're going to be introduced to the different members of the Justice League. But primarily through Batman we do it. He is the major protagonist, almost carrying all the way through this movie. And so you can follow Batman around and basically get... Because he's the recruiter, okay? So Batman, he talks about getting the jet ready and they're heading north. And the first person he goes to see is Aquaman. So Aquaman's backstory begins through Batman. In fact, the first time we hear anything about the Justice League, we hear it through Alfred, through Batman. Batman is the vehicle because... Any backstory that you're going to tell in this story must be tied to Bruce Wayne or Batman. They, it must be. It has something to do with recruiting and how Batman gets along with these people. Always. All of them. They must be tied to Batman. They, 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 they will be in some ways tied to Wonder Woman, but they always come back to Batman. Okay? That's how this story is organized. So that what you will find is that Bruce Wayne goes to Iceland. And he's talking about this person he's trying to recruit. And in so doing, we learn some of the history of this guy visually. We see the three boxes. We see where Aquaman stands in those three boxes with a picture on the wall. That's Snyder decides to do visual actualization, not verbal. They're not verbally giving you the story of Aquaman. He's giving you a visual story of Aquaman through the picture on the wall. Through what Bruce Wayne is saying about Aquaman and about the stranger. And about his special abilities. And Aquaman, he sort of stays masked there until the picture. And then Bruce Wayne realizes that is Aquaman. He's not going to verbalize that it's Aquaman. But then he starts talking about the three boxes which are more interesting to him. And in so doing, Aquaman confronts him. Tells him he needs to leave. Slams him against the wall. And then he starts breaking down Aquaman's file. He starts calling him by his name. This is the first time the audience, for Justice League at least, knows 
who Aquaman is. If you never, never knew about Aquaman, now you're starting to know about him. He's a mystery. He's a stranger. And now you're beginning to learn about Aquaman through and only through Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne is the central knot bringing this team together. Without Bruce Wayne in this story, you're not going to get background on any of these characters. Bruce Wayne has, holds all the files, everything. So if you've got to get to spill the beans on anybody, it's going to be through Bruce Wayne or Batman. I want you to understand how this story is arranged. If you guys don't understand storytelling and you don't know what a story is, you cannot critique a film. You can't say if it's a good story or a bad story. You can't do that. Because you don't know what the story is. Notice that I am not your average guy. I know I'm using the Steve Trevor's line over and over again, but I, I do it because I literally go into movies to hear what they have to say to me. I don't go into movies to judge them before I have heard their story, seen what they're trying to achieve, and I can get the value out of them. Because when I tell you Thor Ragnarok, to me, I did not like it. Let be under, understand, I understood the story being told to me. I saw the inherent value in the story for what it was. And then I was able to tell people what I did not appreciate about the story. I was also in touch with my taste in movies. Because I know it would cloud my judgment and I would be biased towards certain things. So I always said that Thor Ragnarok, while I did not like it, didn't feel like it fell within the realms of the lore of Thor. I thought that I can see how people would appreciate it and enjoy it. Except my taste in movies, I particularly don't like that kind of presentation. So, again, when you are critiquing something, when you're seriously critiquing something, if you're really somebody who you want people to respect, you will critique it along the lines of what its story is telling you, and you must be able to break it down properly. And you must also know the inherent value of what this thing is saying. And you must also show an appreciation for those people who enjoy that particular thing because you have a particular taste. Now that's how critics back in the day used to do things. They don't do it that way anymore. They're very partisan, very biased, and filled with hyperbole, never properly explaining themselves, speaking about plot holes, missing the whole point of the story so they can't talk about plot holes, and there are plot holes in this movie. I have identified a couple of them. Minor plot holes, but they're plot holes nonetheless. But because people are so biased and so clouded in their judgment and never giving a story a chance to tell itself, they'll never see the plot holes for what they really are. You'll always miss the mark. Like I said, I never saw this movie as a masterpiece. Those people say it's a masterpiece. Maybe you have different criteria to me in how you judge movies, but I cannot call this movie a masterpiece. But what I can tell you is that it's solid. Let's keep it moving. So without Bruce Wayne as the center here, because the story says Batman, Bruce Wayne, recruits the other members of the team. So he is like that central point in this story. Everything comes back to him. And so as a result of that, Aquaman who is introduced through Bruce Wayne, is also revealed to us through Bruce Wayne, Arthur Curry. Then he defines what he is, protector of the oceans. Aquaman is also a protector, like Wonder Woman, but he's, ex he's more exclusively a protector of the oceans. His care is for the oceans and people near the ocean border. He's not fond of mankind because he thinks of them as he's here, a shithole when it comes to Gotham. And he calls it a shithole because of the waste. 
that Gotham discards into the oceans. Okay? When Batman does not su succeed at recruiting Aquaman, we know why. Aquaman does not want to be a part of the team, and he does not want to be recruited, and he explains why. And you get the backstory of why. Because he gives you, in verbal this time, why he does not like meddling with Atlanteans, why he does not like meddling with men. And he gives his philosophy, which is very much like Batman's philosophy. Except Batman's not trying to be like that anymore. He's trying to change so that he can deal with a threat. The irony. So Batman's not successful in recruiting Aquaman. The backstory, therefore, of Aquaman will always be relevant to Aquaman's world in the context of the threat coming to the world. We don't need an extra backstory. We don't need to know about uh, Aquaman and Volko and Aquaman's destiny and what Aquaman's challenges are. We don't need to know all that. We need to know it in the context of the threat that's coming with respect to Bruce Wayne. That's the backstory we need to know. Because what is the story? Batman is inspired by Superman and therefore recruits a team to deal with a threat. If it ain't about that, it ain't worth telling. Let's keep it going. So Batman, he's unsuccessful in recruiting Aquaman. He reveals who he is to Aquaman, but Aquaman is not interested in helping him. So he returns to base, which is the jet, and he's talking to Alfred. And Alfred again comes back and re introduces the team a second time. Why would he do that twice? Because this time, Alfred is not trying to introduce the entire team. He's trying to speak of the other two members of the team. And again, through Batman, we hear about the Flash and we hear about Cyborg. But they're not called the Flash and Cyborg at the time. They're known as Barry Allen. And of course, Alfred breaks down Barry Allen because again, Batman has all the information. We have to go back to Batman because why? Why do we need to know about Barry Allen and the Flash? Do we need to know that Barry Allen's, uh, how Barry Allen's mother died? Do we need to know, you know, how Barry Allen get his powers? Do we need to know uh, what stage Barry Allen is in his career, if he's in college or not? Or if he's, uh, what kind of jobs he's holding down? How he saves Iris West? Uh, do we need to know all about that, about Barry Allen? How he's saving people and how he's a superhero? No! Because we're not interested in that. We're only interested in Barry Allen in the context of Bruce Wayne recruiting a team. We're not interested in Victor Stone and how he got in an accident with and the details of how he got into this accident and what the accident was. We're not interested in his past life and all the how he was in a football match and what happened, how he broke up with his team. We're not interested in that. We're interested in Victor Stone in respect to Bruce Wayne forming a team. That's why I kept on asking people over and over, do you know what the story is? Is all this extra information about Cyborg learning to fly relevant to the story being told? I've asked a bunch of people, what's the story of Justice League? They can't answer me. Real simple. But they don't know what the story of Justice League is. These are the people nitpicking. So I said, okay, okay, fine. You want to nitpick? What's the story of Justice League? One guy, he told me, he was so full of bullshit. He told me, he said, oh, the story, my man, I start to tell the story and people ask me questions and interrupt me in between. If you got to take so long to tell a story, if it has to be a para, uh, uh, um, uh, paragraphs upon paragraphs to explain Justice League, I mean, you don't understand what Justice League was. Yeah, a real simple story. And so these guys go all over the universe because they're not focused. They don't understand what a story is. They don't know what they watched. Because they were busy hating on the thing. They never gave it a chance to tell them. They weren't sitting down to watch a story. No, they were there to pick out the CGI. Oh, look how horrible Henry Cavill's face is. When I hear somebody say, you know, they're eager to tell me about Justice League, and the first thing they're going to tell me is, oh, man, they messed up Superman's face. I was like, you got to be kidding me, man. You just saw a whole epic, and all you can tell me about is Superman's face. 
that's what sticks with you, then you did not watch the story. Because you don't know what the hell you watched. Because you was busy being distracted. Let's keep it moving. So we are introduced to both the Flash, as in Barry Allen, and we find out about Cyborg. And of course, Alfred is the one to break that down to Bruce Wayne. And after he talks about Cyborg, who is deceased at the moment, they don't know all the details about Cyborg. They don't know what he is right now, but it gives a, a little background on him. And he says he's currently deceased. He says, I don't recognize this world. These special people with special abilities. You know, they've studied them for a while and they've been researching them from Lex Luthor's notes. He doesn't recognize this world. And Bruce Wayne says, you don't have to recognize it. I just have to save it. Which is a brilliant, brilliant line. It's a brilliant line. Because Bruce Wayne is keeping in line with the story being told. Being hopeful, he is recruiting this team to deal with a threat. It's all about the threat. It's all about saving the world. And Bruce Wayne gets it, and he's in line with the story. All right? So now, after being introduced through verbal means, we get a little backstory on these characters. And we meet Barry Allen. He's going to see his father. That's how they would locate Barry Allen. We see the uh, correctional officer here locate Barry Allen. You hear him press the little device so that Bruce Wayne and Alfred would know where Barry Allen is and that he's going to see his father. Okay. And we actually get a very deep conversation between Barry Allen and his fa father that's based on where Barry's at in his life. And Barry's trying to save his father's life, as Alfred had said, and get him off the sentence because he thinks he's wrongfully... Uh, he was wrongfully convicted. And Barry's determined to do that, but he's struggling. He's trying to pay for uh, schooling to get a degree in justice so he can actually somehow free his father. And his father feels like a burden on him, like he's just keeping this kid back from living his life. And he's telling him, don't come see me anymore, boy. Go live your life. You're running in place, which is a pun <laughs> because Barry can really run fast. But we get backstory so that you can understand that Barry he lives for the justice of his father being rectified we heard about it Alfred spoke about it and now we get to see it relevancy to the story why is that important it's because Barry and his story which you're introduced to is important to understand how Barry liberates himself and comes out from standing in place and really embraces his special abilities to help others and to go further, to move beyond his uh, trying to exonerate his father. He never gives up on it, but his father wanted him to move forward. And again, the connection between Bruce Wayne and Barry Allen. When Bruce Wayne meets Barry Allen, everything's connected to Bruce Wayne, remember. Bruce Wayne meets Barry Allen and Bruce Wayne presents that opportunity to do something more. His father was saying, you need to do something more, bro. You need to free yourself. And Barry gets that something more that he was looking for. His desire to meet other people with special abilities. But Bruce Wayne's not necessarily that person, but he's looking for those people. And Barry jumps at it. Okay? And Barry's thing is all about friendship. This is the, Barry's whole motivation for being in the Justice League was because he wanted to be in something greater than himself. And amongst people like Superman, who have these special abilities and he can relate to them. All right, so he was dying for that moment. Now, remember, Alfred covered two individuals. It was Barry Allen and Victor Stone. So we go next to Victor Stone. Through that device, we are introduced first to Barry Allen and his woes, and then we're introduced to Victor Stone and his woes to his father. This is his father coming from work pretty early. And uh, talks to Howard, the janitor. And then we see his father having a conversation with Victor. And of all the characters in the Justice League, Victor Stone's story is not only tragic, but Victor himself has never, in this entire movie, he never wavers from the grave seriousness of what he has become and the distress and worry about it. The, the only time I saw Victor actually 
for the first time in his life, you see him like a little boy looking for direction was when Superman appeared on the scene. He called Superman, he said, Superman! And he's like looking at Superman, every word that Superman says because he knows that Superman can identify with him because Superman has come from the same birth origin as he has. Superman has become one with the mother box for a minute in time and he's become one with the mother box, both of them born of it. So anything Superman says, almost Victor almost religiously holds on to. But before Superman appears on the scene, which is another principal character, all of these, these three characters, Aquaman, the Flash, and Cyborg, they literally lean heavily on Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman. And that's why the background for these characters must always tie in with those first three. So it's very important when you're making a movie like this, and this is why this movie works, and this is why people talk about the characters are the best part of the movie. It's because these characters weigh heavily on the other three established characters, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. If you look at the story arc of Superman, Superman's story arc is developed through three movies. He is the most developed character in this entire trilogy. When you look at Batman and Wonder Woman, Batman's arc is developed, we get a smidgen of his arc in uh, Suicide Squad. We learn what happened to him after that in BVS. And then we see him finally coming full circle in Justice League. Wonder Woman started off in BVS. We get a really established arc of her in Wonder Woman, the movie, and then it's finished off in Justice League. So each of these principal characters had three movies to develop themselves in. When you include Justice League in the equation. Each of them. And those are the characters that are the most developed because those are the characters on which these characters rest heavily upon. Both for direction, mentorship, and for development. And so with Cyborg, we are introduced to him again Batman was the first to introduce him because it's through Alfred we hear about his story. His story falls right after The Flash. We got a little bit of Aquaman's story. Again, Bruce Wayne was there to help develop that story. So we're getting the other three. So when we get Cyborg, we see the severity of his situation. And he's, he's the most, he's the most uh, solemn of the characters throughout the movie. Okay, Very, very serious until the end when he meets Superman. So what happens is these characters, their backstory must be relevant to their recruitment, relevant to when they join the team. Like Aquaman, Cyborg is a loner. And what he likes to stay in the sh he really likes to stay in the shadows of the shadows. <laughs> he will be like the shadow guy who's on the outside, you know, and I'll feed you information from the outside, but I roll alone, okay? So he's trying to roll alone. Aquaman's trying to roll alone. The Flash is the only guy that didn't want to roll alone. He was like, God, I was waiting for this moment. Man, this, I've been taking this. <laughs> He's the only one that wanted friends, okay? Wonder Woman had to come out of the shadows and hook up with Bruce again because she saw the distress that was happening. But she's just a principal. She's a principal of character. So Wonder Woman, Batman, they're principals. Superman's a principal. When he shows up, you know, it's like he, he just starts running, running the show, okay? So these are the principal characters that have, they have taken a long time to develop in the DCEU. And these other characters, which are now emerging, they emerge off the heels of these principles. And that's the basic way how the background of these characters were established. That's what makes this film so solid. It's the fact that you see these developing characters develop their story arcs in front of our face. We see Aquaman come from somebody who did not want to join the League. We see Cyborg who did not want to join the League. But again, Wonder Woman is the one that really, she's the, like the mentor of Cyborg. When we look at Batman, Batman is the mentor of the Flash that carries him along. So his backstory really must tie in very tightly with Bruce Wayne. The, the Flash has an affinity to Batman, doesn't want to see Batman die when Batman is looking to commit suicide uh, for the cause. He doesn't want Batman to die. The Flash is bonded to Batman. He's bonded to Bruce Wayne. He's a big Bruce Wayne fan. We see Aquaman as a big Bruce Wayne fan taking up Batman's articles and toys. But he's not only that. He comes back. Bruce Wayne was the one that talked to him. He comes back out of necessity. We see his, 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 his home world or part of his home world, his heritage, which he has not really claimed. We see it under attack by Steppenwolf. And that has prompted him to really take it forward. We see the same thing with Cyborg. We see that his father 
who even though he's at conflicts and ends and he's not really happy with what his father did he still cares about his father and so as a result of that he tries to save his father and so he joins the team okay Aquaman and Cyborg have similar reasons and what you find is that backstory weaves into the story. The backstory had relevance to the story and how the backstory of Aquaman, for instance, and his heritage with Atlanta, Atlantia, it starts to have Atlanta, sorry, its tent now has relevance to why Aquaman joins the league. Same thing with Cyborg. His backstory with his father, even though his father brought him back and he didn't want to really come back, his mother was dead because of the accident, whatever. It has relevance to him wanting to save his father's life. And there's a possibility his father's still alive. Because it fits in with the overall narrative. When we look at the Flash, we already know the Flash's motivation. He just he was he was in. It was, <laughs> but now we see how Wonder Woman can help in the backstory of Cyborg and how she gives him confidence. How she has him. Uh, realize the soberness of his situation, but what he, the potential that he has with the abilities and gifts he has. Yes, they are uh, something that he pays for. It's not something he asked for as well. And uh, But at the same time, it is something that can be used for good. And she encourages him and nurtures him on. The Flash is encouraged and nurtures along with Batman when he has to, he's overwhelmed by the situations that he has to face and he starts to shine. And with Aquaman, his purging came, I believe, his, the critical moment with Aquaman was when he was on the ship heading towards the destination. And he really just kind of uh, went through a catharsis where he was just letting out what was inside his mind because he was sitting on Wonder Woman's lasso. And again, she was very nurturing. She was like, that was beautiful instead of trying to embarrass him, even though he did feel embarrassed. So the whole point behind it is these three characters with their background and they give some background again he gives some more background on his conflict and inheriting taking his inheritance up because he's the hero of atlantis and you know how the atlanteans want him to you know to join atlantis and stuff and he doesn't want to do that and doesn't want to hear what they had to tell him and he feels like an outsider and all that stuff you hear that in the presence of batman and wonder woman all right so again the backstory is relevant to his bonding with the team. And it's all about the team recruited. So if this, if, 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 if this backstory doesn't have anything to do with recruiting the team, with Batman, with, with getting a team together, what the hell are you doing a backstory for? Why do we need all these unnecessary details? Mira sends him because she says you have the sense of responsibility. This is what your mother was. This is your mother. And, and we get the backstory that's relevant to Aquaman. Okay, he's disowned by his mother, it looks like. He feels like he's disowned. He feels like he's an outsider. Then he learns that his mother had to do this out of necessity so he wouldn't get killed. And then she, uh, Mira gives him a sense of purpose by saying, This monster, your mother would have gone out there and tried and stop him. But that's now on you because she dead now. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you get, again, this threat why he joins the team, why he's part of the team. Mira is the vehicle to give him the quadrident and the weapons he needs and the suit and all of that so he can fight this thing. You get the sense of why he joins the team eventually. Backstory is only important as the story part of backstory is more important than just back. So people was, certain fans were coming out there and saying, oh man, Aquaman, he talked to Volko. And who cares if he talked to Volko? What's relevant to this story is why did he join the team? We want backstory to know why Aquaman joined the team. We want backstory to know who Aquaman is and why he joined the team, right? We got it. So what's the problem? With Cyborg, we want to know who Cyborg is. And why he joined the team. And we got to know why. You need to have relevance. I keep on telling people relevance is important. So that's why these principal characters were there. And when Superman came back on the scene, initially, it didn't work out well. But Batman was still hopeful. And he had this backup plan. And principals, principal characters, Lewis Lane, And Martha Kent. It was important to establish what they mean to this story. And they early, very early in the movie, without words, established that Lewis Lane had lost Clark Kent. And 
you can feel the sense of loss. And <laughs> Martha Kent, she lost everything. She lost her home. She had lost physical loss. She had lost her son. She lost her husband. She still had a dog. <laughs> and she had ended up in the city renting. All right. Remember in BVS, she had to start back working now. She had to work because her husband wasn't working anymore. He was a farmer. So she had to actually work. Clark couldn't, couldn't help her much. It's really crazy how this guy had superpowers and yet he couldn't help out his mother. <laughs> it's just crazy. So anyway. Um, so these people were established. And so when we, we see them in the story now, we see with verbals, we hear their discussion. And we hear Lewis and Martha's discussion relevant to Superman. Because, see, this story is about Bruce being inspired by Superman recruiting a team. And that discussion that Lewis had with Martha Kent comes in relevant when Superman comes back to life. And we learn that Lewis is still insufficient. She's still not functional. She cannot function. And we hear a conversation with Clark Kent, how she's not strong and she just couldn't make it and stuff. And Clark was able to bring her back to writing those pieces we saw at the end of the story. But more importantly, she was the key to bring Clark back to Earth because she admired the engine of the world while it ran, which was Clark Kent's influence and inspiration and hope that he gave to the world. So what better person, now we're watching the story, it's not like Lewis just comes out of nowhere and Batman just comes up with this idea, oh, Lewis Lane. No, we've been introduced to Lewis Lane in this story. We understand that she admires the principles of Superman. We understand that he was her husband to be because it was an engagement ring. They were on the verge of it. She was wearing that ring all the time. And we understand what she means to him. So it's not, it's not only a follow-through on BVS, but now we've seen it in Justice League. So it comes naturally to us, oh, Lewis Lane was the big gun. We already emotionally attached to Lewis Lane and her loss and the fact that she's now, when she appears on the scene, I heard some people very, it's so flippant. Some people are so flippant. One lady was saying, you know, it looked like Martha Kent was more uh, interested in, 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 in Clark then Lewis, well, she wasn't laughing and filled with joy when she saw him. Well, she wouldn't be. And you know why? Because it was a tense situation. When Lewis Lane saw Clark Kent, if you do remember, it wasn't Clark Kent at the time. It was Kal-El. That was Kal-El we were watching. Okay, that wasn't Clark. <laughs> Kal-El had Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman. He had his head in his hand. He was holding him, levitating high up above the earth, about 40 to 50 stories up. He was about to snap that dude's neck. Telling him, do you bleed? Okay. And Lewis comes out and yells, Clark! And he looks down, because he got super hearing. <laughs> he looks down and sees Lewis with his super sight. <laughs> and, my God, I don't even know how, I don't even know how Bruce survived that fall. He flings Bruce away like a toy. And imagine Bruce falling 40 stories down and hitting the ground. Think about what I'm saying. That's why I didn't laugh in the cinema. I didn't even know if Bruce was alive or dead. I don't know if he broke his neck. I know he can take a fall like that because he's Batman. And I know he could glide down to the ground, possibly. But still, it's just, it's just crazy to think about it. Think about what I'm saying. You got to think in a realistic sense. This is not a joke. So when I saw people laugh at it, I was like, y'all got to be out of your damn minds. Do you understand this guy just fell 40, 40 stories down? And maybe he, he was able to buffer the fall a bit? Anyway. So the importance of Lewis Lane and Martha Kent is pivotal to that. So when we saw the reunion of Clark with Martha Kent... We had seen Martha Kendon early on in the movie. We understood her loss. We understood their pain. And so we were happy for the excitement that we saw. We were happy to see Lewis in, in interviewing Clark. And, you know, Lewis always asks questions. And we can see her interviewing the engine of the world as it's running. <laughs> Which is a callback to Man of Steel, by the way. But that's just... 
And so these are all the interesting things you see in the story. But more so, what's important when we see them at the very end of the story is Martha Kent gets back her home, which she's able to move back inside of her house. And we see again Bruce Wayne intervene yet again. Bruce Wayne saved Martha's life once in BVS. He saves her life again in Justice League. All right? If you haven't thought about it, no, now you do. And so what's ama amazing to me is how uh, Bruce Wayne, the story ends with Bruce Wayne, of course. It begins with uh, Bruce somewhat. It Actually, this is the interesting thing. I don't know if you guys understand the symmetry in this movie. So I'll just point it out. The three major characters were introduced in the beginning of the movie, and the movie ends with the three major characters. It ends with Wonder Woman, it ends with Batman, and it ends with Superman. I don't, I don't know if you noticed that. Wonder Woman is presented to the world. Then we see Batman, when Commissioner Gordon calls him, and his plane comes up. And then we see Superman last. So we end with the Trinity, we begin with the Trinity. I don't, I don't know if you guys noticed that, but it's just a... Zack Snyder symmetry thing going on there that Whedon served to uh, to make sure that it came through that way. So why I say all of these things though is because a lot of people have said that these characters they weren't uh, there wasn't enough backstory of them and um, you know they cut out a lot of the movie and stuff like that. Now there is we know that the movie was cut out because we could see certain scenes cut short and then suddenly we're in a different scene i saw that but by and large what i would say is the continuity of the movie is fluent this is not a a, 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 a discontinuous um, mismatch of a mess no this is not and the way how the new characters are introduced are in keeping with the story being told the plot the story the storyline it's all in keeping with that and so I just wanted to correct that and have people understand a little bit more about storytelling because I think I think in this day and age I think people expect comic book movies to have a, only one specific way of storytelling I think it has to do with the genre particularly that people have become so simplistic in how comic book movies are that they expect comic book movies to go one particular way and I think I, I credit that to the MCU having people basically have simple ways of watching storytelling traditional balletic ways of storytelling and I think that's why people are being so judgmental and because obviously if you watch Batman 1989 Batman 1989 has more of this kind of storytelling aspect not as vast but not as wide I mean this movie covers from one end of the the world to the next end of the world but it's it's more like a james bond movie than 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 say a tim burton batman movie in that respect but um when it comes to the the epicness of this movie and just the the the, the sometimes the mixed plot the, the way the plots interplay with one another i'm surprised that um you go and you watch a movie like uh sully Sully sometimes goes back into time, sometimes it's in the present, sometimes it runs a, a scene over and over again to give more uh, uh, weight to it so that people would get bits and pieces more of a scene. It's what we call an interwoven plot. And the point behind it is what you really want to do, just because it's a genre of comic book movie doesn't mean you have to judge the comic book movie uh, genre exclusively as traditional balletic stories go you you can you can also judge it as an interwoven uh plot which is what this movie is and that's what bvs was as well in fact the other interesting thing about Zack snyder uh films is that you have uh so many different elements that are put into them they're not just one genre i'll give you an example of what i mean Zack will use horror elements in his film, he will use adventure elements in his film, he will use drama elements in his film, he will use action elements in his film, he will use uh, comedy elements in his film. So there are all these different elements that you see pop up in a Zack Snyder film, and this film was no different to any other Zack Snyder film in that respect. What I would say to people is, 
I think you're getting carried away by the soundtrack of this film or the score, the film score of this film. Because it was Danny Elfman who did the film score, you haven't really given this film a fair shake because you've been ca caught up in just the Danny Elfman film score. Uh, and so you've not really looked at how the movie was sequenced, how the, the stories interplay with each other, how the scenes run, and just the general directorship of this film. All right? And you would just clearly see this is a Zack Snyder film. That's what it is. What w, WB was correct. It is a Zack Snyder film. Um, I think a lot of times people get carried away with the musical score. And the musical score does have some weight in movies. I will not lie to you. But at the end of the day, this is definitely a Zack Snyder film. Okay? Alright, so I thought I'd address that issue. I took a little while to address it. But I wanted you guys to get it in quite a lot of detail. If I were to boil this down into a motion picture, you know where I'm, I'm doing little edits of the film, this would probably boil down in three minutes, but because I'm talking to you, I'm rather verbose with verbose and explaining some fundamental things. So, if I were to summarize this movie, Superman is the foundation of this movie, and therefore when he comes back to life, this movie goes into a whole different gear. However, being inspired by Superman's hope, Batman recruits the other members of the Justice League to deal with an oncoming threat. That's the essence of this movie. Uh, and every ancillary character, whether it's Aquaman, The Flash, or Cyborg, they serve to fill that narrative. Okay? Critical to that narrative is also uh, Louis Lane and Martha Kent. All right. So any backstory you got to have, uh, any one of these characters, has to come from the. Uh, to, it has to serve for the overall narrative uh, of the story. It must have some relevance to the story being told. Otherwise, there's no need to have them. All right. On that note, you guys have a great one.